Me and the family live here in Joplin, Missouri, and in 2011, we got hit pretty hard by a tornado. Thankfully, our home was only slightly damaged, nothing a little elbow grease wouldn't fix, but the power ended up getting knocked out for a couple of days after. My son was nine years old at the time and had taken to sleeping on a cot next to our bed because he was a nervous wreck. Anyway, two nights after the storm, the three of us and our three dogs were all asleep in the room when I'm suddenly wakened by the sound of my son's screams. Our house was on fire. I got up and ran to the garage to get our fire extinguisher, but since the power was out and I was panicking, I couldn't find my way around my own house. Thankfully though, my wife was quick behind me with the flashlight that we kept at our bedside with our son close behind. I then gathered up our two Pomeranians and we all ran outside. We called 911 about six times but emergency personnel were so thinly spread in the aftermath of the tornado that it took like 40 minutes for anyone to get out to us. We just had to sit there in the road and watch our house burn. Everything we had left went all up in smoke. With all the debris and destruction around and our house totally engulfed in the inferno, it looked like the world was truly ending. And in a way, for a while for our family, I suppose it had. I don't even know how to begin this. To be honest, I was only able to puzzle what happened a few months ago. I guess I'll start from where I believe is the beginning, but I can't assure you it was the first time I saw him. I'll keep the details pretty vague regarding where this happened as to not dox myself. I know I have pictures of my face on Reddit, but I don't feel comfortable sharing my name or the specific city I lived in at the time. Let's just say that it's in a European city very central and very cosmopolitan. When I was about 15 years old, I was extremely interested in philosophy books. I didn't feel that I could talk to my friends about the subject without boring them. So when this man approached me on the street with a pamphlet about Plato's classes, I was pretty excited. He was about 28, maybe 30 years old, very tall and skinny and kind of crazy eyes. I remember I was kind of a smart aleck and thought that reading two of his most well-known books made me interesting, so we started debating, I guess you could say. It was a nice conversation and lasted about 10 minutes, but it was getting late, so I left it at that. He told me his name, but I honestly can't remember. A couple of days after, I found him on the same street at a totally different time. It was always very crowded, so I wasn't especially spooked about it. I was getting out of the subway after classes. Mind you, I took this route every day until I graduated high school. I didn't live on that street, but that's where I got out of the subway and then waited for the bus that would get me home. I thought it was a cool coincidence that the philosophy guy was at the subway door. This time, he didn't have any pamphlets. He had a lollipop in his hand, and I know it sounds cliche, but it was so eerie to see a six-foot guy just sucking his lollipop and looking straight at me. He said hi. I said hi back. He tried to get the conversation going, but I could feel this weird energy in the air, so I just decided to cut the conversation short. I'd see him once or twice a week, and I just assumed he'd live there and have him be going for a walk at the same time as I was getting home. I honestly believe this weird guy, twice my age, just happened to find his way to me so many times. This is until I saw him in my neighborhood. I was having coffee with a friend and she was telling me that she met this cool guy while playing volleyball on the beach, when the guy, I kid you not, just appeared out of nowhere. He approached my friend and they talked for a bit. Yes, he was the guy she was talking about. He seemed mildly surprised that we were friends but didn't give him much thought so I didn't either. When he left, I started feeling uneasy but my friend thought that he was cool so I didn't voice my concerns. There's this thing about teenage girls that makes them think they're very mature for their age, so we just assumed that he had befriended us separately and then found out we were friends. At the time, none of us had social media apart from WhatsApp, so I still can't understand how he managed to insert himself into my friend group. Eventually, my friend left to study abroad and the subject kind of died out. 
I would see the dude now and then on that same street in my commute, but we would only speak for a few minutes and that's it. This went on for about six months. Sometimes he would pretend he didn't know who I was, but would still approach me saying that I looked familiar. Sometimes he would greet me very warmly. Looking back, I guess he was dealing with some type of mental health problem. Slowly, he was getting bolder. One time, he asked for my number and tried to hug me. I could feel that something was very wrong, but at the same time, I thought that I was being the weird one and he was just a nice dude. Still, I just gave him a fake number. This other time, we went to a church on a school trip and he was waiting outside, talking to my peers. He played it cool, saying that he had seen my face somewhere but was not sure, as if I hadn't been seeing him almost every week for a year now. I was very stupid. I never thought about talking to my parents about this. After all, the guy wasn't violent. He wasn't mean. In my head, it was just a lonely man who happened to have a strangely similar routine. I started to be scared though. I'd look behind my back when I was alone at night. I'd avoid dark streets. I was kind of paranoid, but still, I ignored my gut feeling and shoved it in the back of my mind. After all, as long as I gave him a few minutes of my day when he called out for me, everything would be fine. When I turned 17, I stopped seeing him. I think this went on for about a year. It was a relief, honestly. I could sense that what happened was bizarre, but I'd explain it to my friends like it was funny, like it was a joke. Eventually, I started attending college, so my everyday route changed. I stayed in the same city, though. One day, I had to go through that same street again. I can't remember why. I just know that I was walking, minding my own business. It was maybe 9 p.m., and then I turned around the corner, and there he was. He saw me, smiled, and said he was lost, asked for directions, and I swear to God I felt primal fear at that moment. I felt I was dealing with a truly insane person, because we had crossed each other's paths for two straight years in this exact same place, and he was acting as if though he didn't know me or the intersection. Something about that messed with my mind for a while. I just kept walking. I didn't look at him, didn't utter a single word, and then he lost his mind. For the first time, I saw what he really was. He tried to grab my arm and scream all these sorts of obscenities at me. He said that he had hoped my mom died of cancer. He said that he would kill me. I know I was not alone as there was still quite a lot of people outside, but no one seemed to say anything. He kept screaming his lungs out, and I just started running. I ran, and I started crying. I couldn't control it. And that was the last time I ever saw him. Two years ago. He's long since stopped talking to my friend. No one knows who he is. I can't remember a name to go to the police and file a report. It's like my mind tried to erase him. He was a stellar stalker though because I only understood that that's what he was years after the fact. And I'm just grateful. I'm safe. I'm a 21 year old female and this story took place when I was around 11. I remember this day clearly because it was the first time I was ever allowed to walk to school and back by myself. Up until the age of 14 I lived in what we thought was a safe place in Chautauqua County, New York. Everyone knew everyone. If you thought you would get away with something then be prepared to have your ear abused by the time you got home. There was this one day though. It was a cold winter day and school unfortunately was still open so all the neighborhood kids had to walk through knee high inches of snow just to get to school. It took me longer to leave the house as I was used to walking with the older sister to school since she knew the routes better than me. I always used to make fun of her for being paranoid and taking a different route every day for school but after that day I learned that was what saved my life. As I was waiting by the door to leave, my mom came up to me and told me that I should ride with her to drop me off because my sister was too sick to go today. Being a brat, I made a big deal about walking by myself because I was almost 12 years old and all my friend's parents let them walk alone. She looked at me for a long time then told me to make sure I pay attention to cars. 
I got hit by a car and almost died when I was nine, so the worry that showed on her face was well warranted. I hurriedly nodded and headed out the door to go to school. My sister didn't like to dilly-dally, so she was always in a rush to get to school early, but seeing as it was just me, I thought it would be a good idea to take my time. I would play in the brown slush that was left on the side of the road and even make funny looking snowballs to see how far I can throw them. Halfway to school I noticed a white van following me behind. Being the playful child I was, if I had not been bending down to make another snowball I wouldn't have noticed it slowly creeping up the street. I told myself I was being stupid but continued more hurriedly to school. Once I got to school, I took a quick glance over my shoulder and saw the van a few feet behind me. It wasn't until I was on school grounds that it drove away fast by me. I thought that that would be the end of it, but throughout the day, when I would stare out the window, the van would be there. I assumed that it never really left, just parked. Many adults would try to convince me years later that maybe it wasn't the same one, but I knew it was. This van had a bright yellow smile emoji sticker on it. I couldn't see who was in the van, but through the tinted glass, I knew they could see me. It was now the end of the day and I wasn't ready to go home. It was too late to call my mom because she was at work and my sister was homesick. I had to suck it up and start walking home. I tried to blend in with a group of kids, but most of them were car riders and the others didn't live near me. Remembering what my sister told me, I took another route home. I didn't memorize this route clearly, but I decided anything was better than being spotted by that van. I made it to my main street, but realized my mistake was too late. The route I took led back to the main street where I walked to school. Hidden behind a row of cars was the white van with a smiley emoji sticker. I tried to stay calm and walk past in, but once I heard the van door silently click open... I instantly ran. I could hear the rush of two pairs of heavy footfalls behind me. They were getting closer, so I did what any normal kid would do. I cut corners. I cut into someone's backyard until I was directly in sight of my house and forced myself into the thick snow to make it to the door. My heart was racing not because I was running, but because I could still hear them behind me. I made it to the door and banged with all my might until someone came to the door. My sister looked confused, but one look in my face, and she pulled me inside and locked the doors. The van was still outside. Truthfully, it stayed out there until my brother got home. Me and my sister don't talk about it, but we both knew how close it was to me going missing. I hadn't thought about this incident in years, but one of my hometown friends showed me an article that came out in 2013. Apparently some men kidnapped and assaulted a girl my age. It wouldn't have scared me if it hadn't mentioned the white van. Whoever you are that attempted to kidnap me and do God knows what else, never again. I'm still shaking as I think about where I could have been right now had I not acted on a vibe I had today in a Hobby Lobby. I was at the store to indulge in the springtime sale. As I was browsing the entire store, I noticed that I kept seeing the same man wandering around. I thought that he was there with his wife until I realized he was there alone. I also noticed that he had a Bluetooth headset in his ear the entire time. Not necessarily suspicious in and of itself, but I really started to get a bad feeling when he followed me around the small floral section as I weaved through the aisles. He kept looking at random flowers when I would look at him. I even saw him either quietly talking to himself or talking to someone on his Bluetooth, most likely the latter. I circled through the store several times to make sure that he was genuinely following me and to wait for him to leave before I went to check out. After a while of not being able to see him around me, I went up to the front and got in line. He crept from around a corner and got into the line right behind me still holding the two random flowers that he had picked up. The cashier rung up my items while I typed a note on my phone. I told her that I had an online coupon and showed her the note that said, the guy behind me has been following me throughout the store. She said that she was going to get the manager to verify this coupon. 
The manager came up and read my note and said, With the other sale already applied, we might not be able to apply this coupon, but uh, let's step aside and see what we can do. She took me past the register to get the details while the cashier rung up the man. I told her everything and I look back, and the guy is telling the cashier that he forgot something that he wanted. He then goes back to the floral section to add another random stem to his items. He looks at me, talking to the manager, and tells the cashier that he needs something else and leaves the register again to get another random item. It was at this point that I knew that he was stalling to wait for me. The manager picks up on this too and calls up a male staff member to go out to the parking lot to make sure that the man got into his car and drove away. The guy paid for his four random flowers and left the store. The staff member came back in and verified that he drove away and offered to be in the parking lot until I safely drove away as well. He came out with me and pretended to grab carts until I had safely made it to my car and left. I'm so thankful to the staff that immediately jumped into discreet action to ensure my safety. Now, update, February 23rd. I have a few updates to share. After posting and getting a lot of people advising me to contact police, I did. After I told them what happened, they told me that this guy was likely part of a human trafficking team and was what they call the Scout, who was sent to find a target and was on the phone coordinating a team to grab me in the parking lot or follow me home. They said that these types of operations have specifically been targeting craft stores and places like Target where women often go alone. They worked with Hobby Lobby and have security footage of his face and license plate. I don't know if they've identified him from this, but they've been great at keeping me updated. I also contacted Hobby Lobby Corporate and gave them the store number and the names of the employees that helped me. They weren't specific, but they said that they would make sure that the employees got the recognition they deserved. Thanks to everyone who offered support and helpful advice in the situation. I just moved into a small countryside town, into a house that was just beside a huge forest. It was a new neighborhood and didn't really have much houses on my street. You could, without a doubt, walk hours into the woods and just keep going. Being young and stupid, I'd take my dog walking without having my parents with me or anything to protect me. I don't even remember having a cell phone at the time. Don't blame my parents, please. They were reassured by the fact that my dog was really big and people were easily frightened by him. Like, really easily. My dog was about seven, and this detail is important. I did that often. Nothing bad ever happened, and I never met anyone out there. I loved it because I could really take my mind off of everything else that was happening in life. The moving was rough on me, and to make everything more fun, I was being bullied at school, so... Of course I really needed that. And there I was, casually walking on a track that is across the woods that is used if you have a motocross or a quad. A noise that I didn't take too much attention to at first was coming from behind me and it started to get louder. When I turn back I can see a person coming straight on me on his motorcycle. I'm a 13 year old girl who's scared of about everything that seemed out of the ordinary so I decided to get off the track as quickly as I can to hide. Unfortunately for me, Henry is a large black dog and doesn't blend in well with the surrounding as everything was green and it was the middle of the day. I walked pretty fast, but I can tell that the bike was closing in quickly, and it was pretty obvious that I was standing there. I started running and found a rock that was big enough to hide my dog and I behind. I heard the motocross come and go, it was impossible for the person to really see us. I waited, telling myself that I was being silly by being paranoid about them, and when I thought that I had waited long enough, I started walking again. I froze instantly when I heard the loud engine become suddenly very close to me. Without hesitation, I started to run like a madwoman, and when I was able to stop and hide, I finally did. My dog wasn't in the best of shape, and I was feeling so bad for making him run that much. I could tell he was getting closer and closer to me. It wasn't a very dense forest, so he could follow very easily, and he was so much faster. I'm also a very clumsy person. I tripped on about everything I can, so I 
did meet this lovely branch that I fell on the ground pretty hard after tripping on it. But I think I was so full of adrenaline that I just got up and started running again. He was only meters from me so he could see me and he's clearly at this point chasing after me. There's no doubt in my mind that if he gets me, something really bad could potentially happen. We were approaching a more dense part of the forest so the guy had no choice but to stop. It did give me advantage on him and I was able to get away. I was so glad when I saw a house. It was under construction so nobody lived in it. I did find a hiding spot between its fence. Minutes later, I heard the bike show up and saw the person searching around for me. And I could tell that he didn't see where I went to. I felt this huge sense of relief when he started to blaze off again. And I think I hid there for about 30 to 40 minutes without moving to make sure that he never looped back. I did find my way home and told my parents about it, but they thought that I was just being overly dramatic. In the end, I never found out who this person was. And I did hurt myself, but nothing too seriously. I heard years later about certain people selling things and being grown in that part of the woods and certain cameras around the woods as well. Maybe I came too close to seeing something I shouldn't have and they saw me on the cameras and were coming to apprehend me. When I was about 15 to 16, I was a real party animal always the next town over at my friends' places. Most of the time I was able to stay at their place overnight and head home the next day, but there were a few occasions where I found myself walking home. This walk was roughly two to three hours. If it was a nice night, I didn't mind it at all. It gave me a chance to sober up before I got home. No, my parents didn't know that I was doing this. It was just me being a stupid teenager. At the time, there was a good 40-minute stretch that was pitch black, with nothing but fields and forests on either side of the road. It has since been developed into a shopping center and homes. Every now and then, a car would pull over asking if I needed a ride home. Most times, I would say no thank you and go on my way with no issue. Two times, cabs had offered a ride home for a discounted price and they were both amazing people. They told me about their wives and kids and how I should be really careful walking alone at night. They dropped me off at my house and made sure I got in before driving away. One night, walking home on that stretch of dark road minding my own business, a car pulled over in front of me. Not a big deal, this has happened before. As I was about to walk past the passenger side, the window rolled down. A guy who seemed to be in his mid-thirties asked if I was alright. He was very clean, handsome, and his car looked brand new. He had a smile on his face and a weirdly friendly tone. Every hair on my body started to stand up. This seemingly normal guy was giving me one of the worst gut feelings I had ever gotten in my whole life. I backed up from the car as he spoke to me. Being polite, I told him I was alright and not too far away from home but thanked him for his concern. The smile never left his face but it was just wrong, like it was being forced. He insisted that he could drive me home, then said, There's some scary people in this world, and laughed. By this point, my body is screaming that I need to get away from this person. I faked a smile, thanking him again, saying goodbye and goodnight. I started walking away, pulling out my phone and pretended to call a friend. He sat in that spot for a little while before slowly creeping up beside me again, still giving me that weird smile. Are you sure I can't drive you home? I lied saying that I was just talking to my friend and that he was on his way, keeping my distance from the car. You can wait in the car with me, he said with a bit of an odd tone in his voice. Yet again, I declined his offer. My skin was crawling and I'm sure you could hear the nerves in my voice. I continued with my fake phone call, loudly saying, Oh, you're a few minutes away? Uh Great, you'll see me. The driver's face went completely blank. His smile had gone, not a single emotion in sight. He just looked forward and rolled up his window and started driving away. I waited till he was out of sight before running as far away from that road as I could. I made it home safe that night, although the rest of the walk I was completely on edge. 
constantly looking over my shoulder and holding my phone up to my ear like I was talking to someone. Obviously, I can't ever really know what his intentions were, but if my gut was anything to go off, I truly feel like if I got in that car, I would never go home again. I'm a court clerk. I work for my local courthouse. I work in the clerk of courts, the COC, both in the office and in court, split about half and half time-wise. On Friday, the 4th of February 2022, I was in the office at my desk. I also will assist with customers who come into our office who have questions on certain types of filings. I am the backup coverage specifically for our records window. In my state, we're considered public records. Anyone can come in and request copies from any case, unless it's juvenile, confidential, or sealed by the court. This is really important to the whole story. I was asked to cover the records desk from 4 to 4.30 p.m. last Friday so our records clerk could leave a little early. No problem, I have no issues helping out where I can. Around 4.15 we had a frequent flyer, as we have so dubbed them, and this man comes in frequently to get copies out of his case. I should really note the way my office is set up, it's a bit important. We're set up kind of like the DMV. You have to come into the main entrance of security, go down a long hallway, and it opens up to a lobby. There are elevators straight ahead, the DA's office is to the left, and COC is to the right. You have to open up a separate set of doors into our little lobby. There is a counter with windows, and it's an L shape. If I can figure out how to attach a drawing, I will. The records window is around the corner, tucked in the back. There are also three public terminals where any member of the public can use to research cases in my county. So back to the man, we'll just call him Joe. Joe has an open family case. He comes in probably once a week to get copies out of his family case, or I don't know what he's doing, it's really none of my business. He came up to my window somewhere around 4.15 to 4.20, said he'd requested some documents. When documents are requested from the public terminals, they go to a queue, which I then go into and select them to print. I went into the queue, glanced at the documents and asked, did you have 11 pages? He said yes, so I selected and printed. I wrote him a little slip out with a number of copies and his total owed. I gave him the slip, directed him to go back to window 4 to 5 for cashiers for payment, and would meet him up there. I went to grab the copies off the printer, which jammed, messed with that for a minute, counted the pages, and took them to the cashier. I then went back to my counter to help the next person in line. The next customer was easy. Her records were prepaid and printed. After the second customer was after 2.25 p.m., my coworker a work wife, we'll call her Lynn, asked me if I wanted to go thrifting for clothes at Plato's Closet after work and my answer was, of course, let's go. Right as we're discussing this, I'm in view of the records window but not at it. I saw that Joe had returned to my counter. I went up to the counter and asked how I could help him and he stated, you must be new. I'm not new. I've been at my job for almost four years and in the legal field for almost ten. I replied, no, I'm not. How can I help you? He then made a comment about a paperweight I was using. It was a gift for my niece, a painted rock from a three-year-old. That's a fancy paperweight you have there. Sir, can I... what can I do for you? You gave me the wrong case. Mm, no, sir. I printed off what was in the queue. So you don't need these four pages? I tossed the four pages and then adjusted his slip. Seven pages total. I sent him back to the cashier. At this point, it's 4.30. It's Friday, and we're closed. I left and headed to Plato's closet. It took me about 15 minutes to drive over there. I sat in my car for a few minutes, then went inside, and I beat Lynn there. I started browsing, and she came in a couple of minutes later, stating she got caught behind a train, so we started shopping and chatting, of course. For some reason, I looked at the door when it opened there was Joe. Now I knew it was Joe because he wears that dumb sock monkey hat. I saw him and got Lynn's attention. Uh, are you seeing what I'm seeing? 
so I pulled Lynn into an aisle and we ducked down. She's short. I'm tall and I wear heels a lot. I could watch his dumb hat around the store. He immediately went to the back of the store. It looked like he was rubbernecking the whole store. So he goes to the back of the store, grabs a pair of shoes, glances at them, and continues rubbernecking. I continued to watch him, and as he moved, we moved opposite. We were legitimately hiding behind clothing racks. He moved around the perimeter of the store, continuing to search around, rubbernecking as we said, and looking for something or someone. So he leaves, and we kind of freak out. We check the parking lot to make sure he's gone. We try and shake it off and chalk it up to just coincidence. And then, I realized we were talking about it literally in front of him. And Lynn, she's not quiet. She gets scolded on a weekly basis for her loud, carrying voice. I told the cashiers what happened. We ended up leaving like an hour later. The next day, I felt so uneasy about it. I called my boss and told her what had happened and told her I was going to call the police. I called the non-emergency number and left a message with dispatch. I got a call from an officer a few hours later and explained what happened. He said to get Joe's name. At this point, I recognized him but didn't know Joe's name offhand. He told me he would call me back on Wednesday when he was back on duty. I got Joe's name and called the officer back on Monday and left a voicemail. Monday was fine. Tuesday, I was out of the office, but Wednesday, Joe came back Wednesday. He came at 4.20 to file documents into his case. He took 20 minutes to file two affidavits and a motion. It should have been like a minute, two because he needed something notarized. He left and I had a bad feeling. I called the officer and told him what happened. The officer said he comes back Thursday to call and they would come down and talk to him. The police department is across the street from the courthouse. Thursday rolls around, no Joe, until 4.25. He beelined it for the computer in the corner, and I messaged my boss. We had already put into place a safety plan. The sheriff's deputies, who work security, were notified. Three deputies followed him into the office. I called the PD. Two officers came down, and they questioned him. He admitted to being at Plato's Closet... He was shopping for his two younger daughters, who were nine and eleven. They don't fit into clothes at Plato's yet. Plato's has a sister store, Once Upon a Child. Those kids don't really fit there either. So, he had a receipt in his car for Once Upon a Child for 5.07 p.m. that day. He denied hearing my conversation with Lynn, the whole going to Plato's after work. He stated he left my office at 4.15ish and took his children shopping for clothes, he didn't have his children with him at the courthouse or Plato's. He also asked the officer immediately and unprompted, Did she call you? He also stated that he believed his ex-wife was setting him up. So because my office is a public office and he has made arguably legitimate reasons to come into my office, there's nothing the officers could do. They issued him an oral warning and put him on standby. The kicker is, he could opt into his case electronically, but made a big deal about not being able to opt in a few months ago. We told him if he's having issues, call the court support line and they would be able to remedy the situation. Instead, he chooses to come in and pay $125 per page instead of a one-time $20 fee, which apparently he also paid that. If you weren't already freaked out, last year his roommate filed a restraining order against him followed by his roommate's girlfriend alleging harassment. I won't go into details about the family case. Let's just say it's more than messy. He is also filing extremely high-level types of documents for representing himself. Now, a February 11th, 2022 update, I was in court all day. Come down to my desk at 4.05. He came in at 4.10 p.m. I left while he was still at the office. Now, what am I supposed to do? The officers can't do anything else. I need another incident outside my office to file a restraining order. I've ordered home security, I've signed up for self-defense classes, and I'm purchasing mace and looking into handguns. I just don't know what to expect with this guy. We all make dumb decisions in life, but... In this case, I was stupid. 
very stupid. I arranged to meet a guy off Tinder, but because of my heightened anxiety about driving, I arranged for him to pick me up outside my place. I had been talking to him for a few weeks at least, but that is not redeemable, and I know that. The choice I made on this day could have ended me, but thankfully I'm still around to tell the tale. The guy picked me up in his car and told me he planned to take us out for sushi. I love sushi, so I thought, great. He put in the name of the restaurant into his GPS and we were off, making pleasant conversation on the way there. Until, until I started seeing woods when I looked out my window. I felt very confused. We were supposed to be going into town, not into the wilderness in the middle of nowhere. And fear hit me hard then. He said, I swear the GPS is taking me through here. I, I didn't choose this path. Just please take me back to civilization, I said. My eyes were wide and I must have looked like a deer in headlights. His face was really apprehensive, so he must have known that I was scared completely crazy. Oh my god, I thought to myself. I should have just conquered my anxiety about driving and met him somewhere public. Or better yet, not met with this guy at all. What was I thinking? I'm going to get murdered here in these woods. I tried checking my phone to see if I could assist him with the GPS, and that's when he said those spine-chilling words. Uh, there's no signal out here. I remember just thinking to myself to try to look calm. Don't let him think you suspect he's onto something. But man, did I feel terrified. The tips of my fingers were cold while I was simultaneously sweating. If he was going to kill me, Part of me wanted him to get it over with so I wouldn't be left in anticipation. His forehead was perspiring. He kept saying, I, I swear I'm not doing this. I'm trying to get us back on route to the sushi place. I said, You know, I don't care about sushi anymore. Get us to a gas station. Just any, anywhere with people at this point. And he responds, I don't have a shovel or a weapon or anything if that's what you're thinking which did little to calm my nerves. We finally reached the restaurant after what felt like an eternity. I'd never been so scared in my life. I didn't have much of an appetite and I was physically trembling when we arrived. But I figured he didn't kill me when he had the chance, so I guess it was safe now to continue with our date. I already planned on taking an Uber home because I didn't want to go through that experience again. I was shocked out of my mind when he then asked, So do you want to go back to my place? I nearly choked on a piece of sashimi. What? I didn't know where this was coming from, and I didn't know how he could ask me something like this now on a first date when he literally saw me pale as a ghost just moments ago. You know, like, how long will you make me wait before we, uh, you know, get it on? A day? A week? A month? I stared at him, dumbfounded. I couldn't respond because I was utterly speechless in that moment. Well, I can't wait a whole month. I'm telling you now, he said. I didn't say anything and the rest of the date was just insanely awkward. I said goodbye as I took my Uber home and only seconds after my driver pulled out of the restaurant parking lot, he texted me to say that he doesn't think it'll work out with me because he needs a girl with a higher libido. I didn't argue. I just texted back a simple okay ready to be done with this man. When the Uber driver drove me home, he didn't take me through the wilderness pathway of a potential murder site. He took me through the streets, other cars, lights, the sweetest scene to my immense relief. I couldn't help but wonder why my date had to take me through an hour drive through the wilderness to get to the restaurant, but it only took the Uber driver 15 minutes to get me home from the same location. The whole thing was chilling. I don't know if my date planned on anything sinister or if it was an honest mistake, but I am glad I made it out alive. I learned a tough lesson that night, one that I should have already known but that I foolishly ignored for some reason. Don't let strangers from a dating app pick you up in their cars. I'm a 19 year old female when this happened. I attended a church most of my life where the people there were more like family. 
My sister, who I was always very close to, was 18. And there was a new guy that started coming. He was about 28. He was in the middle of getting his degree and looked like he had a good head on his shoulders, but something seemed off about him. It appeared that I was the only one who felt this way. I observed him running after a group of children and the pit of my stomach would just feel sick. He seemed to have an attention for my sister too. She was 18 but always looked younger for her age. He would always have a sick smile on his face when talking with her. Again, nobody else seemed to notice but me. Another woman from the church commented to me that the guy seemed like a good catch and we should set them up on a date together. I opened up about my suspicious feelings to my mom and to a few others, but they would laugh it off as me being jealous. I would have nightmares about warnings that my sister needs to stay away from him. I would learn later that my sister went on a secret date with him actually, and this guy insisted that they meet at her house. He wanted her address, but she said no, that we'll just meet at a public place. Soon after, the pastor's wife mentioned to my mom after church that this guy had been to jail for inappropriate actions against a child. He was out on probation and trying to get his life together. My mom felt sick after that. She gave me a huge apology, and now my feelings made sense. My sister was afraid of him now, but didn't want to let on that she knew what he did. He wanted a second date, but I was with her when she told him she was just too busy with college. He thankfully let her alone and soon left the church, and I had heard very soon after that he was rearrested for doing the same thing to a teenager. I ended up leaving that church for good. Someone else could have been hurt because this was kept secret, but they wanted to help rehab him somehow, and I learned a valuable lesson, that you always trust your instincts. My stepmom didn't like us much, but she told my older sister and I this experience growing up to scare us out of being stupid. It was my family's stranger danger story. My stepmom, Macy, grew up as kind of a privileged teen in the 70s, and her mom had moved their family over to the States from England when she was about nine. She went to a pretty nice high school in a nice town. There, she made friends with a girl, Lily, who didn't exactly run with Macy's type of crowd. They really hit it off, and Lily would take Macy out to do her type of stuff. Hiking, fishing, and sailing. Anyways, because of Lily's influence, the two of them would do stuff like that a great amount. One Sunday, they decided to go hike in some hills about an hour away. Macy put on what I'm sure were her extremely expensive hiking shoes, and the two of them drove off to the hiking trails. Lily parked in this big clearing with makeshift parking spots. But there were no other cars there. This was only important in hindsight. They started hiking up the hill off the path because Lily fancied herself as something of a badass. The hike was nothing extraordinary. Anyway, they reached the top of the hill and my stepmom was done. The polished, pampered side of her was coming out. She groaned until Lily said okay. They would rest and then walk down again slower. They had been heading down the hill for maybe 10 minutes when Macy started whining again. Lily conceded to walking down the side of the road instead of the rough hiking trail. So, there they are, probably looking like a couple of tools, geared up for hiking and walking down a crappy road. And after not even 5 minutes, a truck pulled up next to them. It was red and rusty and just generally looked like a clunker. The guy driving rolled down the window and the girls looked in through the passenger side window. He had a big beard, a baseball cap pulled down, and long brown hair. He greeted them and even smiled through his beard, asking if they needed a ride. Macy described him as charming and even cute. Lily still says the moment he greeted them, her hackles went up. Despite her better judgment, my stepmom convinced her to get in the truck. It must only be a 10 minute drive down to the car, tops, she told her. The two girls opened the passenger side door to this rusty old thing, and the guy directed them behind the seat to get in the back. They settled in and the truck started rumbling forwards. Lily always says that was the point that hit her what a mistake they just made. The back seat was clean enough, 
but there was a rope on the floor, behind the driver's seat in four boxes of saran wrap, half hanging out from under the passenger seat. It seemed creepy and weird, but Lily didn't want to freak my stepmom out, so she just kept her mouth shut. After ten minutes, the woods didn't look any clearer, and they hadn't seen another car the whole time. Lily asked how long he thought it would be. He said he was taking a different route down the hill and had to stop somewhere to get something first. That was it. The girls were 16, and Lily didn't want to have to press the issue. She was scared. She can remember his hair because she was sitting right behind him. He looked like a woodsy guy, but his hair was super tangled and dirty. She noticed crusted mud on his collar and tried to find something identifiable about him, but she just got scared the more she picked up on the little details. He was youngish, strong looking, and had a foot on both of them. So they didn't ask any more questions, and he didn't offer any information. They just drove on. Several minutes after that, they reached a tiny shack cabin looking place right there in the clearing of trees. There was an old stump where someone had been chopping wood, and a huge axe stuck into the log. Lily was definitely on red alert now. The guy turned off the truck and slipped out of it, saying, I'll be right back. Don't get out and he disappeared into the house. Lily tried to talk to my stepmom about how incredibly uncomfortable she was, but she mostly just dismissed it. Lily started begging, increasingly freaked out, and finally put her foot down, demanding Macy exited the truck with her. So, they got out and walked around the front of the vehicle. The house was about 50 yards in front of them, and they wandered around looking at it hesitantly. If this guy really was decent and just trying to give them a ride, it would be super rude just to run off, right? My stepmom had this strict upbringing when it came to manners and a public persona. She saw it as an issue of that nature, so she actually started to head back to the truck, opening the front door to climb in behind the driver's seat. Lily was pissed off and followed her to yell some more. On the driver's side floor, hidden under the seat, there was a big hatchet. It had dried reddish-brown stains covering the blade and stuck to the floor under it. Lily understandably lost it, and seeing it, my stepmom started getting hysterical. They decided that leaving was by far their best option at this point. They just booked it off to the side of the property into the trees. They bumbled around in the trees for a little while until Lily was fairly confident that they were on their way back down the hill. My stepmom cried the whole way down. Lily felt bad about it, but was also completely freaked out that he would hear it, and kept trying to calm her down. When they finally got back down to the bottom and saw the old wooden fence that surrounded the original parking area, they were relieved. But as they got closer, they saw it. The truck. It was parked on the other side of the gravelly makeshift lot, just sitting there, facing the other way innocently. They couldn't see if anyone was in it, and of course... Macy wanted to run for the car, but Lily was hesitant. She managed to calm my stepmom down, saying she wanted to wait before running out into the open to see what was out there. Remember, this is the 70s. There were no cell phones. There was no ranger station or anyone around. The parking lot was big, empty, and open, and who knows what would have happened had they decided to stroll across it. Thankfully, Lily convinced my stepmom to chill, and the two of them hunkered down against a big tree, hidden by the bushes and other trees. They waited it out for what seemed like to be a couple of hours, when dark started to fall. All the animals started coming out and making noises, and my stepmom started getting antsy about this and bothering Lily, who was tired and moments away from giving in. She was just planning their dash to the car when they heard a clunk. Across the twilight lit lot, they watched as one of the back doors of their car swung open. The bearded guy slid his way out of the back seat. He got out, shut the door, looked around at the surrounding woods for several minutes, and then walked back to his truck. The truck lumbered past their car and out of sight. Several minutes after watching him drive away, they sprinted to their car as fast as they could, jumped in, and peeled out before they had even shut the doors. Lily grew up to be a badass adult. She does stuff like hike mountains and stuff, but with her dogs now. 
My ex-stepmom grew a brain at some point in her life, and isn't as derpy or terrible as she was sheltered. And thanks to her, I always check my back seat before I get into my car. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And do you remember the transcript of Gargalon? Gargalon D's nuts.